From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. There's, you know, we, we talk often about the value of death and how the government usually likes to step in to try to fund programs that will help get research projects more into commercialization or technology transition to something that, um, you know, has, has a market. Um, and when you think about something as emerging as, as additive, there are a lot of complexities. It's one of the first, uh, for example, it's one of the first digital, um, like digital first manufacturing processes that we've really had to deal with in terms of, you know, the Department of Defense, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, buyer in the world. That's Elizabeth Henry. This is the founder of Henry General Strategies, a consulting firm focused on strategies for the business side of scaling emerging technologies, like additive manufacturing, to reach their full industrial manufacturing potential. Rooted in strategic communication, this brings nearly 20 years of industry, government, and coaching experience as a partner to high-performing organizations in emerging technologies to lead the team at Henry General. Before we get started, head over to www.3degreescompany.com and subscribe to the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the show anywhere you download your podcast, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Stitcher. Also, if you or your company are looking for materials, qualification, or general added manufacturing support, reach out to the team through our website or via email at info at 3degreescompany.com. All right, Liz, thank you so much for joining the show today. Uh, excited for this conversation. We've gotten to know each other over the last several years, it seems, and overlapping additive events. So um, excited for other folks in the audience to, to hear your story. And um, like I do with all the guests that we have on, um, we start at the very beginning. Uh, where were you born? Um, what was kind of grown up like and, and what kind of got you on the path towards uh towards the added, eventually the additive space. We'll get to, get to all the middle, but kind of what were some of those early formative days like? Sure, sure. Thanks so much, Mike. It's um, it's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, part of this podcast. We've had some really, really fun conversations in the past, so happy to, happy to be part of it. Um, sure. So I actually grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My family's all from the Midwest. And um, what's interesting is that I grew up making things um, and my mom was an art teacher. And so she often would have all the kids in the neighborhood hang out in the yard and we would just make things, whether it was out of twigs from the woods or whether it was with clay, whatever it was, there was always a very healthy culture of making. This was in the 80s. So when you were either watching cartoons or running around in the backyard. Um, so I feel like I grew up with a healthy um, desire to figure out how things were made and and what went into you know thinking about a new thing um yeah so that's kind of the 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 core of it all and i feel like that's something that really resonates with a lot of people in our industry they're folks who just uh, are drawn to building or making or designing and how did that influence kind of your academic tra trajectory like were you kind of pushed towards different things in high school and kind of eventually college where what talk a little bit about that yeah, so I actually took my first engineering class in high school, which was really cool. And it was um, very old school engineering. It was actually um, drafting um, on a piece of paper with a pencil, like learning how to, you know, write in all caps. It was really very interesting. And it was a uh, very old school. It was right before they actually took out in my high school, they took out the uh, the wood shop and the metal shop and replaced it with a computer lab. So we were the last class to kind of go through the engineering um, uh, curriculum. And I, it was an elective, but, you know, I took it as a freshman. It was one of the one of three freshmen and one of three girls in the class. And it was a really interesting experience because it was a completely different language or structure uh, through which I thought about making things. When you do things as a kid, you 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 build some, something because you want to. You're not building something to solve a problem. You're not building something to optimize something. And um, in that class, we started to really think about why are you choosing a particular material? How do you communicate to somebody else why something needs to be um, designed a certain way? Um, and it was much more of a problem solving skill set. And that really appealed to me a lot. And how did that kind of those types of classes, like, w w was there something driving you to a specific, yeah. I don't know, career or job that you had in mind, kind of the big picture down the road that you were looking out five, 10 years on? Was there a grand plan? Fascinating because when I was a kid, I really wanted to be an engineer, but I knew that I didn't really fit the mold. 
And what I ended up doing was going a completely different path. I never pursued engineering, uh, you know, from an academic perspective. I actually went really deep into languages and studied linguistics. Um, always had this, uh, you know, identity as a maker, always had this desire to make things and see how things were made. And that led me to a lot of really neat conversations. But I did start by studying fine arts and studio. And that led to, you know, a lot of really neat skills, acquiring a lot of skill sets, whether it was sculpture or programming and Photoshop and all that stuff from, you know, the very early aughts. Um, but it was really interesting. I never really went into engineering in the same way. Um, and and I think a lot about why, you know, I think a lot about, you know, the fact that I was kind of pushed in certain directions and not in others and um, encouraged in certain ways. And I feel like a lot of, uh, I'm going to say, women aren't as quickly pushed into engineering as a lot of guys were. Um, and so I, I feel like I kind of wonder how things could have gone a little bit differently had I really gotten into engineering early on. Um, but I actually came about um, into sort of our, this field, the advanced manufacturing and engineering field, pretty late. Um, so I worked for about a decade in Europe, um, you know, doing strategic communications and really leaned on the um, linguistics. I learned a whole bunch of languages and realized that I didn't really know what I wanted to do professionally, but I knew that I hadn't figured it out yet. And I had a, a hunch that it was probably a, something that hadn't been invented yet. So I'd, I'd always had a really interest, uh, a really strong interest in a lot of um, emerging technologies and a lot of the things that were just on the brink of becoming. And I think studying art, really being at the edge of things and thinking in a very creative space um, really helped me uh, find some of these really neat pockets, whether it was, you know, something like 3D printing, new materials, new processes, um, and, you know, iPhones, which came about, you know, 2007, fairly recently, and all the design that has come about from uh, from that from, from just experiencing that and being in, in this generation. Um, so back to the actual engineering thing, I, I actually learned about additive through one of my clients. And I was working with a, um, a research professor um, in Switzerland who happened, who had English as her uh, third language. And she happened to be working in additive and composites. And I thought that was really neat, but I didn't, didn't know anything about it. And as somebody who wants to know things and is genuinely pretty curious, um, I would ask her about it and say, well, you know, we're working on language, we're working on your speaking voice, we're re working on your writing voice, but tell me a little bit more about what you actually want to write about. Tell me about the thing you're trying to do. Are you trying to convince, you know, a foundation to give you money? Are you trying to convince a national, you know, some, some national funding body? Are you writing a grant? Are you um, trying to convince students to take your class? What is the thing that you're trying to do with language? Um, you know, using language as a tool. And so it actually gave me um, insight into her world. I found like, oh, this is actually kind of interesting. Realized that it wasn't all writing papers. It was a lot of things that were, um, let's just say very human and connected with me as somebody who had explored making and materials from a very different perspective in a very different way. Um, and that experience actually attracted me to a lot of other folks who had um, an engineering research background and I would work with them and they wanted to work with me because I was interested in the content as well as the medium. Um, so I ended up getting into, um, into additive when I made a really big decision and decided to move back to the US from Switzerland after spending what, eight years there. And, um, and I said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm tired of being a generalist tired of working in this sort of humanities space, I'm going to pick something. I'm not going to go to engineering school, but I'm going to pick a topic. I'm going to pick an industry that is emergent or emerging. And this is 2015. And additive was sort of having a moment. It was, you know, you know that the Gartner hype cycle, it was at the peak, you know, <laughs> starting to really see that this was going to be a hard thing to do. And I realized that it was the kind of industry that I could learn a lot about very quickly and help remove some of the barriers, find the right way to be an asset to the industry, be an asset to mostly the engineers who were implementing this, whether they were mechanical or, or materials or, or, or systems engineers. I had built a career complementing engineers and helping them um, you know, navigate systems, navigate or build organizations, find ways to achieve different things that were not part of the, let's just say, academic engineering skill set. Um, and so in 2015, I, I kind of, I had a listening tour. I actually took six months off and I said, I'm going to learn about a lot of different technologies. And I had some great conversations and, um, 
ended up uh, getting a job at X1, um, which is close to where I grew up in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. And when they hired me, they said, you know, we really need somebody who can talk to our clients because they're not traditional manufacturing clients. They're folks who are coming from sometimes a design background, sometimes an arts background, sometimes, you know, just a very unconventional, not automotive, aerospace or medical background. And so the people receiving a lot of these files, trying to figure out if they could print them with certain processes, um, were, you know, trying having having miscommunication. And so, of course, it ended up being this communication activity that um, pulled me in. And it was a sales activity. I ended up working for for X One doing um, their channel sales. So I uh, helped X One sell a lot more of their product through channels like Shapeways, Materialize, Sometry, all these B two C sellers that were that had um, digital solutions and ways to uh, quickly bring a lot of different. Um, different eyes, different designers, different uh, design engineers uh, to to uh, the company. And only after about 18 months at X1, I ended up getting headhunted off to, you know, start this other job. And that's sort of how I ended up with the, the DOD and the systems perspective. And so it's a, such an interesting uh, kind of path. I have tons of questions. So the first one is uh, like, it was such a... Uh, a, a different perspective than you like you articulate with a lot of engineers and material scientists that you deal with at at a lot of these added conferences and added industry in general i think it's so valuable to have a different perspective that you're able to connect different dots with people right like there's a very hardcore like sometimes the the technical piece but then it's like how do you make that effective right there's a difference between making it work and making it effective and whether it's a company whether it's a technology whether it's a partnership or consortium or whatever it be but um what were some of the key skill sets that you had kind of uh grown like kind of um kind of built on as you were in switzerland and and kind of were were honing that really helped with with that piece as you kind of started your your career in the in the editor space oh gosh you got to listen to people you know everyone's got their their own way of seeing something and it's not always evident uh based on you know their company or their job or how they look you know you always you just have to you know treat people as as people um and and start to understand you know how how they see the world how they see the challenges where they see the opportunities um and i'd like to think that i you know, look at, at industries like ours and see people first. I think that's a really important sort of cultural approach. Um, whether, you know, anyone who's studied abroad or even traveled um, or have, you know, has a, a family that's um, from, from a lot of different cultures, like you, you kind of have to understand we're not really all made the same way. And so same thing, I would say, you know, cross-disciplinary within our own industry. Additive is, has a, has, has a, a very diverse group of folks in it, um, you know, academically diverse, culturally diverse, everything. And so what's so neat about industries like ours and work that we do um, that's heavily engineering based is that we have certain ways of thinking about things, think certain ways of thinking about things. And we also have certain ways of doing things. And we need to like additive challenges and disrupts sort of uh, the the ways things have been done, we need to really challenge ourselves as well and and be open to the, well, what if we did it differently? You know, well, what if that isn't the only path? Well, you know, that sounds really neat. Let's think a little bit out of the box. And so it's it's a tempering of, you know, the very innovative and the what works. Um, and I want to say it's it's in many ways deeply creative, but it's also deeply empathetic like you you need to understand the challenges that other folks are, are dealing with or the limitations that you might not realize if someone's having a really hard time in a sales role you might not understand how something is being uh, calculated for instance it might be a metrics issue somebody's having a really difficult time you know characterizing a particular material you might not understand what industry it's for and you know something for medical is very different than something for a, you know a design application um, so doing a lot of listening trying not to lean on assumptions um these are all, I would argue, deeply human things, very culturally, you know, uh, aware things. You know, you, you kind of hone these skills whenever you go outside your comfort zone. So when you were working at X1 in the, in the sales role, do you have any particular conversations or interactions that like really stand out that were kind of not specifics and per se, but like representative of kind of the 
the time or the thinking of of how people were perceiving additive and 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 have those changed now you're several years almost eight ten years on from from that point point in time so that was early right there was a lot of hype around additive at the time you know that a lot of folks were kind of coming to our industry thinking this is going to put me out of work it's going to take over everything and i feel like then we were having we were entertaining really big conversations um with folks who had no idea um, the range of technologies that fit under the umbrella of additive. They were coming to one and thinking, oh, you know, this kind of a particular thing was everything that additive had to offer. And so it was a huge education activity. You know, every call was an opportunity to help people better understand what the bigger picture was. Um, and I felt like that was a really helpful thing um, for, for a lot of folks. We need to have these one-on-one -on -one interactions. We need to say, well, what, you know, how do you see it? What's your what is the thing that you're trying to do that may or may not make sense from, you know, somebody who's deep in the industry, but why did you think this was a great thing to do? Well, maybe there's something there. Maybe there's a different way to do it. Maybe there's another adjacent technology that this person might not have heard of yet. And so I feel like there has to be a bit of a, a generosity when you're, you're talking to folks who are, in, whether you're in a sales role or an executive education role, or just the strategy role, consultant role, whatever, you need to have generosity and understanding about what these people might or, might or might not know and why they're coming with a particular question that may or may not sound, you know, really relevant or really kind of out there. Yeah. And, and for sure, I think that's also the, the long-term view of this, right? Like there's a short-term gain of like, Hey, I need to sell a machine or like hit numbers for next quarter. But there's also like, how can you cultivate a relationship that is mutually beneficial three years, four years, five years out? Cause people remember those types of conversations were like, Hey, like I remember my conversation with Liz that she was really helpful on that. Now I'm ready to either take the next step or go in a different direction. I'm going to call her up again and, and talk to her. Right. Oh, well, thank, thank, thanks for that. I hope, I hope I, I, I have been, you know, I want to say practicing that longer view um, because I feel like that's, this industry is here to stay. Um, what's really interesting is how I think it's really integrating with a lot, a much bigger picture of advanced, of advanced manufacturing. It's connecting with robotics. It's connecting with other advanced materials and manufacturing, um, you know, processes really. And, we're, we're maturing as an industry and it's important to understand the history that we've had as an industry and where we're going. Um, but, but I think you're absolutely right. It's all about the long, um, about the long view. And, and frankly, it's about relationships. It's about understanding who you can talk to because we're learning so quickly. One of my first rea like realizations that I was in the right industry was that I realized that like one year in the additive industry felt like seven years in any other industry I'd ever been in. It just moved so fast. And it was so neat because everyone was eager and and aware of how to learn. Nobody was getting stuck in what they were doing last year. Nobody was getting stuck in what they were doing a quarter ago. They were all saying, okay, I've learned since then. Here's how we adjust, whether it's an approach, a sales approach, whether it's a, a process, you know, um, optimization, whether it's a team that they've, you know, recently realized works really well to achieve a particular thing. People are always learning and that's a really healthy thing to have in an industry. So I feel like when you open up those comms, when you start to understand how, how, how to learn, it works really well. So you teased it a little bit. So what was, you didn't, you're not still at X1. So what, what was kind of your, your next step in, in your career? That was just the gateway. Um, what was really neat at the time was X1 was one of um, uh, a number of, uh, I think hundreds of companies that, that kind of came together to found this, this uh, program called America Makes that is funded by the, um, it's a partnership, it's a public-private partnership uh, funded by the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Um, and that program was launched, I think, during Obama's second term. So that was 2014. Uh, this was 2016, 2015, 2016. And what was interesting is that um, X1 needed somebody to represent their company at some of these America Makes meetings that were coming together. And they were doing all this big industry activities at the time, like uh, technical road mapping. They were getting a whole bunch, hundreds of people in this in one room at a time saying, what's important in our industry? How do we make really big strides 
How do we make invest? How do we design investments so they actually move the needle, um, which is functionally the role of the federal government, right? Like they're they're going to support things that industry doesn't support. And America makes was this pre-competitive activity. It's a really interesting uh, place to meet a lot of different people. And I ended up meeting some some folks who were actually part of the um, and and they see they conversations that happened at America Makes at the time were really interesting to me because I like to think big strategic <laughs> in the sort of network perspective, but also longer term. And that seemed to resonate with some folks who were supporting the program. And so very quickly, I got headhunted out um, and ended up joining the, the government, um, the strategic support team for the government in that on the public side of that public private partnership. So there's a there's a team that sort of manages the America Makes team and then a team at the DOD that I was part of. And what was really neat was that when I moved from industry into this government role, you know, functionally as as a support contractor for the Department of Defense, you 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 have to learn a new language. You're still in the same industry, but you have to learn a completely new language for how to deal with something that was previously very familiar and very easy. And then, of course, it becomes very complicated, um, but also very important because it's at a much higher level that you get to engage and start to anticipate things. And so what was your kind of day to day like in 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 that role? What were you kind of um, for a lot of I mean, certainly as a small, medium sized company um, or a small company, really, but like sometimes dealing with when you say the federal government, right, it seems like this 10,000 pound gorilla in the next room that there's no door in or way to engage with. So kind of you want to kind of from an insider's perspective, like what what does a what does it actually look like? What What's happening? So I'll tell you, I, I really leaned on a lot of skills that I learned um, from living abroad. Um, when you're really out of your element and everything around you is has been established, it's a culture, it's a structure that's that exists in a certain way for a certain reason, you have to tread lightly and you have to go in as an observer first. You need to look around and say, okay, what? I, I don't, I might not agree with the way, you know, certain things are, are done or it might not, it might feel a little foreign to me, but why is it this way? And so I feel like you have to start by asking a lot of questions and you have to start not by saying, oh, it should be this way, or I'd rather this instead take a step back, <laughs> kind of check your privilege and, <laughs> and really take a look at it and say, all right, there's something going on here that I might not fully understand why does this exist the way it does? And where are the opportunities to have influence? And then when you take a step back and you start to understand, okay, this is the, whatever thing I'm interacting with is part of a greater whole. And it there are reasons why certain, certain things exist and certain teams exist and certain engagement opportunities exist. And you really have to look for the openings. You have to look for the openings. Sometimes you have to look for personalities and people who tend to blaze the trail or open up things. You need to look for different models of programs or teams that um, that are the way to usher in things like innovation to something that is fairly steadfast and doesn't seem to move very quickly. So what's really cool about additive and what was so cool about this role that I had as a subject matter expert in additive manufacturing, working for the as a contractor to uh, the Department of Defense at the OSD level. So this is the Office of the Secretary of Defense. That group kind of coordinates across the services. They don't tend to have the money. The money lies in the services usually. Um, but the job is to kind of coordinate and make sure that um, we're doing things in a more strategic manner. Um, and what was so neat about that was that you, you you had a little bit of time to understand what does the landscape look like and why are we even being asked to do this? And do people want us there or do you need to help them understand why you're even there? There's a lot of diplomacy and, and I don't use that word lightly, but you kind of have to understand that everyone's trying to get something done, usually you know with a lot of stressors around them. And you have to be generous, you have to be understanding, but you also have to know like, what's your role within the bigger thing? Um, so it was a really humbling experience, I feel like. It, it really was an incredible learning experience being part of sort of this, this core team. Um, and one of the first things we did was we, we set up this, um, the, the JAMWIG or the Joint Additive Manufacturing Working Group. And when you set up a new thing, you have to be aware that you're probably 
you know, messing with something that other people saw in a very different way. So you need to be sensitive to that. You need to be understanding. You need to have the conversations. And I think a lot of that is is really just being being a good representative of whatever thing it is you're peddling, you know, whether it's a, a program or whether it's a, a product um, and, and being really open and with, with your communication about, you know, why you're doing something and why you're being asked to do something and what tools exist to give you the power to do something. Um, but it's really, it's really about knowing what your role is and trying to do a darn good job of it. Yeah. And certainly for, for us as American makes owners, I can't remember when we, we joined, but it always has been a very good forum for us to hear what the high broad thinking is and then actually see it in action and see it kind of implemented over time, whether it's through projects or workforce development or Jamwig or whatever it may be. Like, I think it's, it's been a, a cool model to at least be part of and, and seeing all the different parts to that are fundamentally going towards the same goal, right. Is to, grow added manufacturing capabilities within the US and Department of Defense, right? Like I think there's a collective goal that makes everyone kind of on the same team for for at least most of most of these conversations. It's it's such a cool exactly. We're all kind of trying to do the same thing at this stage. We've got this emerging technology or technologies, excuse me, additive is many things. It's not just one. We've got these emerging technologies. We've got um systems that are in place to invest in technologies to get to something really special, whether, you know, no matter what industry it's in. And there's, you know, we, we talk often about the value of death and how the government usually likes to step in to try to fund programs that will help get research projects more into commercialization or technology transition to something that, um, you know, has, has a market. Um, and when you think about something as emerging as, as additive, there are a lot of complexities it's one of the first, uh, for example, it's one of the first digital, um, like digital first manufacturing processes that we've really had to deal with in terms of, you know, the Department of Defense, which is one of the largest, if not the largest buyer in the world. And when you think about that, it's like, oh, well, th there are a whole bunch of things we have to figure out how to get right here. And additive, it's not just additive, it's actually a bit of a pathfinder technology for a lot of these much, um, for, for, for a lot of things that are going to come in the future that we haven't perhaps even thought of yet. So as you were kind of working in that role, you're obviously dealing with, there's academic partners within America Makes, there's commercial partners, there's businesses, there's all sorts of partners. But I mean, from your perspective, what what made a good, like when when you were looking in, in your role and helping kind of form these, like what, was, what did success look like? Like what, how were you trying to gauge, like is what we're doing working? And, and like, how do you, how do you measure some of that? How do you kind of get feedback when you're in s such a big problem space? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and I think it's important to bring up that no, no one person is in charge of anything in a lot of ways. <laughs> it's always an incredible team sport, whether you're working on a program or part of a team, like anything DOD is team oriented. And so you have to look at what, how something is written, you know, at, sometimes it's, you're not the, per the person executing is not always a person who wrote it, right? And so you kind of have to look and try to understand and sometimes even decode, you know, what was what was somebody trying to do by putting these certain words here? What are we really trying to accomplish here? And sometimes you got to um, think much bigger picture and think about how, you know, who's going to use this project when I'm done with it, you know, anticipate the next step before you actually finish it. Um, I, I've always found that no matter what the stated success is, you always want to try to just come up with an attitude of try to make it the best or try to make it better, try to make it such that somebody picking it up is going to know what to do with it. You never want something to dead end. And so I always try to, and this is perhaps more of a philosophy thing than an actual answer, but a lot of the time you, you just want to make sure that you're, you're doing the handoff right. Um, so whatever thing is you're executing, whatever, you know, group you're pulling together, you want to make sure that it fits with a greater narrative. Um, and, and that's one thing that I've found is perhaps a healthier mindset because it can feel frustrating sometimes, you know, you're working on these longer term, bigger projects, you know, what are you really doing one week to the next? And, and sometimes it's hard to sort of feel really accomplished and approach. <laughs> Yeah, that succession planning and thinking about kind of what's next is, 
I mean, I know as running a small business, that's that's that can be challenging. And thinking about the, that aspect of <laughs> with all the other plates that you're spinning in the air, um, and and so as uh, how long were you at kind of OSD? Kind of what what was your kind of tenure there, and then what was kind of the next step for for you after that? Yeah, so that was six, almost six years, five and a half years. So what was so neat about from the period from 2017 to 2022 is we really got to see a lot of maturity happen sort of across the DOD. We got to see kind of the top down organization meet the bottom up, you know, user uh, desire and and coordination and groundswell. It was a really neat time um, to, to kind of follow not just additive, but also robotics and a lot of other emerging technologies in this space. Um, you kind of, a place grows on you if you've been there for such a long time. And and what was so wonderful from my perspective is that I really fell in love with the teams. I really fell in love with the cross-agency team, the, the, you know, the DOD team. This industry as a whole is, is something that's really captured my interest. And I feel like there's an incredible potential to really not see it through, you know, really, you know, ride this wave and, and help it really commercialize, um, scale up uh, and really, in, in, in sort of complete the circle. So part of what I was doing on the government side was helping um, help, helping on the government side of things. And there are a lot of quirky things within the government that a lot of folks who haven't spent time on the inside are, are unfamiliar with or unaware of, um, or just unsure how to read or how to engage with. And so one of the motivations that I had when I kind of realized it was time to move on um, was that one, I didn't want to leave the team, but two, and or the industry, but I also really knew that I had something else to offer. Um, and so I looked and I thought, well, I've been helping the government for this long, trying to better understand industry. Why don't I jump the fence and help industry better understand the government? There aren't too many people at that space. And it seems like everyone kind of needs personalized advice on how to do that Personal for, for a company, right? Every company is different. Every company has their own culture and they're trying to deal with things in a very different way. And I thought, well, heck, this is something I should try. And so I I did actually look around for other jobs and I thought, I, I realized I kind of knew what I wanted to do. Um, so I had some interesting conversations with some organizations, some, some larger organizations in our field. And then I thought, well, I think I know what I want to do and I don't think anyone's really doing it. So let's try this thing. And so I spun off and, and kicked off a small business that is rooted in strategic communication, um, but really is leveraging those, you know, very recent and very relevant six years working with additive specifically within the DOD and some of the networks that allow for that investment to, to really happen. So what I'm doing right now is working uh, at this sort of in intersection of industry, academia, and government. And thinking with that much longer view, trying to think, well, what, you know, investments do we need to make and what is industry, academia, or not-for-profits role in supporting the government in some of those investments? You know, where are those opportunities to anticipate needs? Where are those opportunities to help as part of a team or part of a group um, that is at this, you know, really unique, at this really unique way, trying to push this industry into much more of a, a, a scalable enterprise. And what was going through your mind as as a small business owner, kind of going off on your own? What was that? What was your uh, thought process there? Oh, I, it's it's terrifying because you have to rely on your on yourself, but you also have to rely on your network. What was so wonderful. I knew it was the right thing to do because the kinds of conversations I was having with people were so affirming. Um, I got fantastic clients right off the bat because these were people that knew me from my previous roles. They knew the kind of thinker I was. They knew the kind of problem solver I was. They knew the fact that I cultured a really strong network of other problem solvers that I rely on all the time. You know, it's, I'm not a, I'm technically a one woman show, but I'm also very much um, a networked individual. And that's what we have to do. We have to rely on other people in this space. Um, you have to know who to trust. You have to know how to, how to, how to, how to build your team. So it's absolutely terrifying to start a small business, <laughs> especially, you know, walking away from a nice, comfortable job you could probably keep forever. Um, but, you know, it's it's also a really empowering thing. And, and you learn, you're forced to learn very quickly. You're, you're forced to challenge yourself and come to terms with your strengths and your weaknesses and to 
start to, you know, build around them and, and, you know, anticipate some of the challenges you're going to have in the near future, whether it's, you know, how to grow or whether it's, you know, how to, how to stay part of conversations that you used to maybe take for granted a little bit. So it's, it's, it's a very affirming thing when you know you're doing something for other people and it's actually taking root. What was the most unexpected thing of starting your own business? Um, that's a darn good question. I would ask you that question. Um, <laughs> let me think. Probably how little time I'd have to do the basics. Um, I didn't even think about, you know, marketing and, and websites and things like that. I leaned really, and, and I still, you know, have, have to do a lot of that. I, I leaned very heavy into, well, I'm just going to do good work and realized very quickly that I, I need to very quickly find some people that are very good at that, <laughs> who can, who can um, do a good job of packaging um, for a greater community that might not already know me uh, from my previous work. So there's always, you know, the people you know, and then there's, the world outside of your network that you don't know. And you need to do a good job of communicating that, even if you're somebody who's um, network oriented, right? So I think a lot of the things that are the most surprising, I haven't figured out yet. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I mean, uh, the same for me. I mean, it's like the, I think when I started, I didn't do any marketing. It was all like, uh, like people would find you, right? People would have like, hey, you need to talk to to Mike about this or like that. And that's how I kind of relied on it for <laughs> eight years or so. And just like the network you have. And so, I mean, you do the best what you can with the resources you have. So it's, uh, I think it, it comes with uh, kind of, how you adapt, right? And and it just sometimes has a way of working itself out. Yeah, it 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 absolutely does. It does. But you learn new things every day, right? And you always have to adjust and sort of say, all right, well, I thought that goalpost was a little bit further away. You know, let's you know, let's make some quick decisions. And do you see your business still kind of really focusing on kind of advanced manufacturing, added manufacturing, or do you see kind of the potential to like the idea of like connecting or helping industry work with government, like that's, there's a lot of different tracks that that could take. Do you have a a, a, a vision for that? I've had all sorts of ideas, but I know that at least in the first year, you know, I'm about eight, nine months into it right now. I, I The first year I need to really do a good job of what I know very well. And I am starting to gather some ideas about how to broaden that. Um, you know, I, I have spent some time with the robotics industry as well. Um, and uh, standards development industry. And there's some really interesting challenges. Um, but I think what, you know, sets, you know, small small businesses like mine apart is that we're, we're, we're trying to think very strategically and we're trying to think very long-term and we're trying to be very inclusive. Um, and so when you think about anything like additive, it, it's not just one thing. It, it is, it is, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to a lot of other digital first technologies, you know, present um, and being adopted. Yep. So it's, you know, additive is not one thing. So it's, it's, it's really easy to have a broad scope, even within additive, even within advanced manufacturing, but this is where I'm going to stay for right now. Right. And as the clients that I'm attracting, continue to challenge me in new ways, you know, I will, I will grow that team and I will try to broaden that scope a little bit, um, you know, emerging technologies and uh, the, the scalability factor of a lot of real things like hardware um, and industries that, that require manufacturing is, is such an interesting space to be in. And there aren't, you know, we've, 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 industrial policy is no longer a, a bad word, right? Like we're really shifting things from the early 80s, the US really divested from a lot of, you know, making things in our country. And that's really changing now. Um, so I, I am very hopeful about how to evolve this business. And, you know, it's going to hold my interest. It's it's changing so quickly. Um, I do look forward to, to sticking around in the industry for a while. This yeah. is a great way to start, but it's also a great way to, to branch out. And so not to uh, take free consulting advice, but I mean, I guess what, if you had to give kind of a, a company in the industry, like like a, a piece of advice for dealing with the government, like, do you have kind of what's the high level thing, one thing that they should be doing or should be thinking about at least? It's, it's you're, you're, you're right. It's a challenging question to ask because it is very 
personalized. But generally, any especially small business needs to really look at themselves and say, all right, so if I want to engage with the DOD, what do I expect to get from it? And then you want to try to find a user. You want to find, try to find somebody who understands what you're doing and why you're doing it and the why you're doing it the way you're doing it. Um, so sometimes taking one step back and kind of studying the landscape or trying to understand if somebody pushed you towards one particular program or activity or RFP, why did they do that? Ask questions, build relationships. A lot of folks within the government are very happy to engage. Um, not They don't like when you sell to them. So if you want to engage with them on a technical topic that tends to get to I want to say a better result, at least in the in the first couple of conversations. You know, I think the now that I'm rethinking it, I think probably the best piece of advice is don't try to sell to the government. Try to talk with the government, um, and and try to find some folks who are maybe a similar education as you. Um, if you're a master's of a particular kind of engineering, try to find some people in a similar you know in a similar scope of work or a similar team. Somebody who you'd be really happy to be on a team with. Um, and then start the conversation there. And don't always think about, oh, I can get money. Think of it in terms of, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. Who can help me? Or who has an incentive to do something similar or complementary? Sure. Oh, that's great. And so kind of switching gears for kind of the last question, um, I like to ask people kind of, is there a book or uh, paper or, or piece of writing that has made an impact on kind of how you you've developed your career and kind of where you are today? Oh, gosh, got to read all the time. Uh, and I think, I think, yes, there are a lot of things that I've read that have had a lot of impact, but I think more than anything, it's reading outside of one's comfort zone. It's, it's, it's about thinking, looking at what you're doing and then try to find something that completely challenges the way you do something. Um, and whether you experience that through, you know, a friend or a family member who kind of says, hey, read this. And usually your reaction is like, that's not my thing. Try, try, try to embrace the challenge or embrace the, the fact that, you know, it might not be your thing, but there might be something in that story, narrative, article, book um, that, that makes you rethink the way you've been thinking. Um, I think similarly... Take, take, I want to say taking taking a trip that really kicks you out of your comfort zone. I know that's not a, a book, but experiences can sometimes be very powerful as well. Um, and sometimes writing um, and and really thinking about why are you doing something the way you're doing it can, can be enormously helpful as well. The reflection side, um, as well as the, you know, reading side. Do you have any upcoming trips that's going to kick you out of your comfort zone or like a bucket list of what you wanted to do? Oh my gosh. I would love to be able to do that right now. I have so much additive stuff on my schedule. I can hardly, <laughs> hardly see straight. Actually I do. I do have one thing. I'm going to be attending uh, Hanover Mesa uh, in, uh, in April this year. And, and Hanover Mesa is a really interesting uh, German trade show. And if you've never been to a German trade show, oh my gosh, go. They're, they're, they're huge. They're terrifying, uh, terrifyingly huge and, 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 and intimidating because there's so much to see. Um, but what's also interesting is that you, you get to see how other cultures and countries frame something that's very familiar to you. Um, and so I'll be there and the, uh, for the first time. And I would just encourage folks, you know, don't, you know, if, you're, if you've got usual, um, conferences you go to, go to something that's completely out of the box every once in a while. And um, foreign is helpful. Foreign is not really the right word. Different from what you're used to is is probably the best thing to to, to say. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited about that. That is, I'm going to have to wear, got to wear very comfortable shoes for, thing, for shows like that. Um, but I also am trying to only schedule half of it so that I have some time to be inspired, take in things that I haven't, you know, be, be open to, you know, the serendipitous conversations that come up when you do that kind of travel. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Liz, for joining the show today. Um, great to see you as always. And I'm sure I'll run into you in the coming few months of, of trade shows here that we have coming up. So thank you again. Thanks so much, Mike. These, um, these are great conversations and I'm really glad you're spending your time with so many folks from our industry this way. So thanks.
Be sure to check out our website, www.3degreescompany.com, for more content.